So um, in, to keep with time, I'm going to hand, hand you over to our first speaker, which is Professor Sev Kevin Sinclair. And he's going to be speaking about how we can reduce the crude protein content of the dairy cow's diet. Over to you, Kevin. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Stephen, for that. Is it working? Yep. OK. Um, good morning, everybody. And um, I'm uh, based at the University oh, of Nottingham. And this project um, that I'm going to talk to you about today is one of, of several that have been uh, undertaken in the last uh, four or five years as part of the Dairy Co. or now AHDB Dairy Partnership, Research Partnership. And uh, so uh, the, the remit that we had in this particular study was, was to see if we, how low can we go in terms of dropping protein levels in high-yielding dairy cow diets. Now, uh, Stephen's already kind of introduced the subject. I'm not going to dwell on it too much. Uh, but one of the principal drivers is obviously protein uh, prices or protein costs. And uh, this little graph here, I hope you guys can see it. If not, there's monitors at the back there that you can look at. But it's really just showing uh, or illustrating the trend uh, over a sort of five or six year period in soya prices. Now, soya prices peaked um, at around about £430 a tonne back in 2013. Since then, they've come back quite a bit in prices, about £250, £260 uh, a tonne currently. But, you know, the, the long term trend is for, for protein prices to continue to rise uh, given the increase in, in the global population and, and demand for, for animal products is likely in the long term to, to continue to increase. So we need to find cheaper ways of, 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 of feeding dairy cows. Reducing the amount of protein in the diet is one strategy. The second strategy is looking at homegrown sources of protein, which is going to be talked a, a little bit more about later in this session. The other thing, as Stephen pointed out, is that uh, the nitrogen or, or that we feed to dairy cows is actually used very inefficiently. It's only about a quarter to about 35% are actually uh, retained by the animal and goes into milk. The rest goes out the back end of the animal, either in the urine <coughs> or in the feces. And so um, we, we, it's been well established that if you actually drop the levels of crude protein in the diet from around about 19% down here to just under 15%, you can see that there's much less uh, urea nitrogen uh, going out in the urine and the feces. And the nitrogen that's in the diet is being captured to a much greater um, efficiency. So a strategy is to reduce costs and, and to use nitrogen more efficiently and, and, and be less of a pollutant. So this is a kind of um, um, sort of uh, sort of framework that we that what we've been thinking about. This is sort of kind of our, our paradigm, if you like. For about fifty or sixty years, um, and my predecessors were uh, were preoccupied at looking at this sort of response curve here. This is just this is just um, a figure that I've made up uh, just to illustrate the point. We'll look at real data in a moment. But it's looking at the response of, of crude protein in the diet and milk yield. And so they were looking at ever and ever, you know, greater and greater increases uh, in, in milk production and, and looking at the uh, nature of this uh, particular response. Now, <clears throat> th this is real data uh, taken from uh, a review uh, of uh, studies that have been conducted mostly in North America. And uh, over a number of years, uh, each one of those dots is an individual study. Some of them were entire lactation, some of them were early or mid lactation. Uh, a range of different crude protein sources in these studies, um, a range of different diets as, uh, accounts for the variability. But you can see this uh, curvilinear uh, relationship here. And the difference, and I, and I want to point this out to you just now because it's something I'm going to come back to a little bit later in my talk. If you drop crude protein levels from about 18% down to around about 15%, then this would predict that you'd expect to see a, a hit in yield of about 1.5 kilograms per day. Okay. So just keep that figure in mind because we're going to come back to that a little bit later. So here's our experimental paradigm again. And, and in the past, we were looking at responses going up this curve. Now we're looking at res you know, how we can, um, you, know, you know, what happens if we actually reduce protein levels in the diet. We're coming back down this curve here. And so <clears throat> the only way that we can actually mitigate losses in terms of milk yield is to try to see if we can capture the nitrogen that we're feeding to these animals more efficiently in the rumen. Uh, that nitrogen then has to be highly digestible, absorbed, and then subsequently metabolized and used efficiently in the animal for milk production. So we're, you know, we're, we're interested in, in looking at these processes and how we can actually improve this. Now, we started by actually, before we actually did any animal work itself, we actually undertake, uh, undertook a large comprehensive and, and systematic review of the subject, which was published uh, a couple of years ago now in, in Animal. And uh, in this review, we, we looked at a number of factors that, uh, you know, that were going to be important in terms of reducing protein levels in dairy cow diets. 
Uh, clearly, stage of lactation is important. There's, intuitively, you'd expect that there's greater scope to drop protein levels in late lactation compared to early lactation. And this is something we're going to come back to a, a little bit later. Uh, the forage type is also important. Um, and there's been work done at Reading um, and, and, and work being done elsewhere that have looked at this. And, and, and we'll touch on that a little bit later as well. We're obviously interested in the consequences. We want to improve the efficiency of nitrogen capture. But uh, we might expect that there'll be a hit in, in milk yield, uh, sorry, in feed intake, and leading to a, a hit in milk yield. And we're also interested in, in cow health and fertility, so that the system has to be sustainable in, in that respect. And then we were interested in looking at what effects can we, um, what can we do to actually mitigate this, uh, these effects, this drop in protein level, um, by looking at the levels of forage in the diet, the levels of starch, and NDF stands for um, neutral detergent fibre. It's, it's kind of like a, an S, a measure of the digestible fibre in the diet. And uh, rumen protected amino acids, which I'm not going to touch on, but I understand that uh, Chris is going to make some reference to that in his talk, uh, which follows mine. We'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, so this is a study that was carried out in Hillsborough, Northern Ireland, a few years ago now, uh, by Sinclair Mains Group. And they were looking at uh, dropping levels of protein from 18% down to 15, down to uh, as low as 12% uh, crude protein. Fairly standard diet, 55% concentrates. A sort of fairly standard uh, ratio of uh, grass silage to maize silage, 60 uh, to 40. And they looked at six combinations, and I'm not going to dwell on all those. I just wanted to point out um, the, the, the four combinations at the bottom here. Because <clears throat> you can drop protein levels to, say, around about 14% in early lactation and also in late lactation you can expect to take a three kilogram per day, an average hit in terms of milk yield. Um, similarly, um, if you drop it in early lactation, uh, but you feed excess in late lactation, you're still looking at this three kilograms drop. So er clearly dropping protein levels in early lactation is, is not a good thing. If you feed relatively high protein levels during early lactation and then drop the protein later in lactation, then it's kind of somewhere in between uh, the, 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 the control and, and these more extreme uh, treatments. And so, again, the drop here is about one and a half kilograms, okay? So um, this is the figure that we're going to keep coming back to. But at the same time, you can clearly see that we can increase the efficiency with which nitrogen has been used for milk. But you don't get, get paid for that. Uh, that's just a, an added bonus, uh, but it's worth uh, pointing out. Also, that uh, by dropping protein levels in late lactation, um, that you can see that the, uh, the, the improvement in nitrogen capture is as good as, as dropping it throughout lactation. And so it's, it's feasible to drop nitrogen or protein levels in late lactation. How practical that is, in, in for, particularly for herds calving all year round, is, is, another, is another matter. Um, but uh, the challenge is trying to drop protein levels in early lactation. This is some work that, uh, that Chris Reynolds now in Reading has done uh, a few years ago. Um, and here they're looking at different proportions of grass silage and maize silage. So this is a predominantly maize silage based ration. And this one here is a predominantly grass silage based ration. And uh, you're looking at uh, uh, dropping protein again from 18, 16 down to 14%. So one of the things that to notice with the maize silage based rations is that intake was greater in this study than it was the case for the grass silage based ration. But when you drop protein levels in these diets, uh, then you took a hit in terms of intake. Okay? You can see that there's a, a great improvement in terms of nitrogen capture, the efficiency of nitrogen utilization. But the key thing is what effect would it have on milk yield? And again, you're seeing this figure of about 1.3 to 1.5 kilograms hit in milk yield by dropping protein. So this is something um, that we are uh, interested in. Um, this is a study um, which is quite really quite important, I think. It was carried out in, in Wisconsin, in, in North America, by a guy called Glenn, Glenn Broderick and, and colleagues. And again, they're dropping crude protein levels from 18% down to about 15%. And in the United States, uh, producers are paid um, for, for the, the protein content of milk, the true protein content of milk. That influences the payment. It doesn't in this country. And if any of you are not familiar what we mean by true protein, then if you look at the total protein content of milk, uh, it's made up of true protein plus non-protein nitrogen. So if you look at the average protein concentration of milk in this country, which is about 3.28%, uh, then about 3.1% of that is true protein and about 1.8% is non-protein nitrogen. And about 50% of this non-protein nitrogen is urea. Now this has absolutely no nutritional value as far as milk is concerned uh, for human consumption, and which is one of the reasons why the, the US are paid on, on true protein basis. <coughs> 
Now, <clears throat> if you look at what the consequence was of dropping protein um, levels in the diet from 18 down to 15%, it had no effect on the yield, that's kilograms per day, of true protein, but it significantly reduced the amount of non-protein nitrogen, that component of the milk um, protein, which is, is, has no nutritional value. The other thing that they did was that they altered the level of fiber and starch in the diet. So if you drop the level of fiber, proportionately, you will increase the amount of starch. And the consequence of that was to significantly increase the amount of true protein um, in, in the milk, or the yield of true protein, I should say, kilograms per day. Uh, but it had no effect on non-protein nitrogen. So, in other words, if you can capture the nitrogen that's in the rumen more efficiently by altering the levels of starch and fibre in the diet, you can drop protein levels and shouldn't take uh, too big a hit, in, perhaps, in terms of yield. So, this is a kind of review and some of, some of the main findings that came out of that review that we undertook. And so with this knowledge, we, underst we undertook a production study, and it's important to emphasise it was a production study, um, uh, which began in sort of 2013 and 2014. And in that study, we looked at trying to reduce the levels of crude protein in the diet from about 18% down to about 15%, or just under. And uh, we carefully formulated these diets so that they were marginal for supply of metabolizable protein. Uh, which is just about 5% or so under what the animal's predicted requirements would be. Uh, we were scared to go too much, uh, much lower than that. We thought that we might um, take a hit in terms of intake based on, on previous studies. And so one of the things that we wanted to do was to increase uh, in one of the diets the energy content of that diet, the supply of metabolizable energy. Uh, because if there was a hit in intake, we needed to make sure that the cows were still consuming enough uh, ME. And we also altered the, the, the proportion of starch and fibre in one of the diets as well so that we can try and capture this nitrogen uh, more efficiently. So that was kind of like the aims of the study that we actually undertook. Now this study uh, involved 90 dairy cows. They were sort of first parity through to fifth parity uh, animals. And we undertook it at two centres uh, because we wanted to test how reproducible it would be in, in different milking systems. So half of the cows uh, that were participated in the study were at our herd at Nottingham. We've got about 240 cows at Nottingham uh, that are going through robotic milkers about three or four times a day on average, producing about 11,000 litres per cow. And also over at Harper Adams, uh, where they have a rotary parlour system, cows milk twice a day, uh, producing a similar, similarly high-yielding uh, dairy herd. So this is a diet um, that I just want to spend a few minutes uh, talking about. Um, and it was formulated for um, a, 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 your, your typical uh, Holstein cow producing 45 kilograms of milk per day. And uh, a, a high proportion of maize silage in this diet, much higher than most of you would feed or we appreciate. And one of the reasons for that was that maize silage is less variable than grass silage. And the analysis was actually very similar between Harper Adams and Nottingham. And putting in a high proportion of maize silage helped to sort of standardise the sort of variability that you might see in forages between the two centres. Um, the other advantage of putting a lot of maize silage in the diet was that it meant that more of the protein was coming from the concentrate component, which is not what you guys would want to do perhaps in practice, but from an experimental point of view, it gives us more flexibility in terms of trying to see how we can tweak the system and, and, and how that might affect, uh, make things work. So we had about uh, 0.75 uh, maize silage and about 0.25 grass silage, which is quite a low proportion of grass silage. A little bit of wheat straw in there just to help buffer the rumen. And uh, so what we've got is a controlled diet. We have a, a low-protein diet, which is standard energy. So the energy concentration of this diet was the same as the control. And this is a low-protein diet with high energy. So we increased the energy density of this diet. And we did that by reducing the proportion of forage to about 45%. And we also put a little bit more starchy concentrate into that, which I'll show you in the, in, in the next slide. Um, retrospectively, we came back and uh, we looked at metabolizable protein supply and relative to what the animals required. And we were looking at about a 5% reduction in metabolizable uh, protein supply. And, and, and we pretty much hit that uh, across the two centers. And we, we figured that that was probably uh, as low as you could go without there being a, a profound hit in, in, in yield. Um, so this is the diet uh, concentrate components in the diet. Um, these ingredients down here, soy pass, wheat feed, uh, molasses and rapeseed meal, they're all standard. They, they were kept fixed. They weren't altered at all. The key ingredient that was altered was hyprosoya. This formed part of the control diet, but we took it out of the two low-protein diets. 
And uh, if you take soya out, you've got to put something else in, in, in its place. So for the standard energy diet, we've increased the amount of uh, maize uh, grain and wheat a little bit, and also a little bit more sugar beet pulp. Um, in the low protein, high energy diet, uh, what we did was that we increased the amount of uh, wheat and maize grain uh, much more substantially, and we dropped the amount of soy hull. So we're reducing the amount of fiber in that diet and, and, and increasing the proportion of starchy uh, concentrates. And the, the rationale, as I pointed out earlier for this, this treatment here, was that if there was a hit in yield, or, uh, then this might give the animal more metabolizable energy, but also it might help to capture the nitrogen more efficiently in the rumen, and, and that might mitigate any loss that we might encounter. Now, it's important to put a feed cost to this, and the costs that I, I've got up here on uh, this slide were based on, uh, what we, uh, based on prices back in 2013 when we actually began the study. So that's when soya was at its, its high, all-time high price. And uh, if, you, um, if you look at this uh, low-protein standard energy diet, by taking soya out of the diet altogether, reducing the protein down to around about 15% crude protein, it was saving of about £131 uh, at that time. Um, and uh, if for the high, low protein, high energy diet, you're putting in some more expensive uh, ingredients in the form of wheat and maize grain, at that time it was pushing up, uh, the saving was about £70. But with milk prices back in those days, and not, not, not current milk prices, um, a one uh, litre per day loss in milk yield will lead to uh, a, lactation, a loss in, in income of about £85, 85 pounds. so you're really working on the margin here. You know, uh, the economics might have changed slightly uh, since, but I bet you the, 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 the outcome, the comparison, won't have changed at all. So we had to get it right. So this is what we found then. In the next couple of slides, I'm going to present data which just shows you the average for the cows at Harper Adams and the average for the cows at Nottingham. Uh, and then the three treatments averaged across uh, both sites. Okay? So um, the dry matter intake for, for the animals at Nottingham was actually higher than at Harper Adams. And there's a couple of interesting reasons for that, which I'd be very happy to discuss um, uh, you know, during question time. But it meant that the level um, of uh, energy in the diet, energy density, and the crude protein content of the diet was slightly higher at Nottingham. Uh, again, it, it, this is something I'm happy to talk about a little bit later. It comes down to the way the animals were fed. Um, but if you look overall, there was, um, the intakes uh, did not differ between the treatments. We were no hit in intake. Uh, we did push up the energy concentration with this diet, which we hope to do. And also the, the level of starch in the diet uh, was increased. And that's what we hope to do. If you come then and look at yield, um, then the cows at Nottingham um, were uh, slightly higher yielding than the cows at Harper Adams. We already knew that. And of course, they were eating slightly more as well. Um, the main in in comparisons of interest here are, are the three treatments. And here there was no significant or statistically significant difference in milk yield. So we did not see a hit in milk yield uh, in this study. However, you will note that the difference of 42.8 and 41.3 is 1.5 kilograms, which is what people have talked about before. Even though we had 30 cows per treatment, we, we, we couldn't prove that that difference was statistically significant. But then if you look at the low protein, high energy, it's 42.3. That's a kilogram higher. So um, it's kind of in between. So we, there, there's a hint that we might be mitigating the effects uh, with the high protein, low protein, uh, high energy diet. We'll come back to that in question time if you're interested. The key thing uh, I wanted to point out was that if you look at the amount of urea in milk, then we significantly reduced it from about 25.8 milligrams per decilitre down to around about 15. And, and that's really very significant. And if you look at the efficiency of nitrogen capture, it was very much improved in the low protein diets. Now, I just want to put these figures into context. Um, I hope you can see that from the, the monitors as well as the, the screen here at the front. Mm -hmm. But these are data um, are pr published back in 98 by Bruce Cottrell. Okay? And these were foraged. In red here, we're looking at forage-based diets fed to the national herd of dairy cows across the UK. And we're looking at milk urea levels. And they're averaging at about 30 um, milligrams or 300 milligrams per litre, which is 30 uh, milligrams per decilitre. And here, these are cows that are out at grass and they're averaging at about 360 or uh, 36 milligrams per decilitre. And uh, so you can see that our values here, even among our control animals, were, were, were much lower than the national average. And that's probably a reflection of the high, maize silage, uh, high levels of maize silage in the diet. When you look at our two low protein diets, this is where they lie, okay, compared to the national average. 
So you can't really push it much lower than that without you sort of coming falling off the edge of the, uh, you know, the cows crashing all, all together. We probably pushed them at about as low as we, we could safely go. Um, <clears throat> I just put up this, uh, what might look a rather busy slide, because it's interesting, right? So the, the cows at Nottingham are robotically milked, and so they can come back and forth to the robots as much as they like. And to begin with, they were kind of visiting the robots between seven or eight times a day. But the robots are programmed to only allow them to be milked so often, and so they get kicked away. But interestingly, the cows that were on the low-protein standard energy diet were visiting the robots more frequently than the, the control cows or the, control, or the cows that were on the low-protein high-energy diet. Okay? And it seems that um, these cows were looking for something that was missing in their diet. And if you fed more starch or more energy, they were fine. If you fed more protein, they were fine. But if you were deficient in starch and uh, energy, uh, and as well as protein, they, the cows were coming back to the robots. They were looking for something. But it didn't affect their uh, frequency of milking because the robots are pre-programmed to kick them out if they, if they don't, um, you know, when, if they come too often. We kind of looked at uh, uh, mobility as an, an indicator of lameness. And uh, this is the uh, mobility scoring system that the AHDB uh, dairy uh, promote. It's uh, a scale of zero is no problems, and then you have uh, an increasing scale of one, two, or three if they've got mobility issues. Um, this is simple analysis I did here. Um, we looked at the proportion of cows with a mobility issue. Uh, we have more uh, lame cows in Nottingham than they have at Harbour Adams, um, I'm ashamed to say. Um, there's also an effect of parity that you can see here as well. Uh, the older cows had more mobility issues than younger cows, and this is what you'd expect. But there was no evidence at all that feeding low-protein diets ha had any influence on, on as far as mobility or lameness is concerned. The other thing that we were interested in was fertility. And when we actually looked at the literature in this, in our review... Um, there was virtually no studies that have ever been done to actually look at the effect of feeding low-protein diet. Uh, there was some back in the 1970s and the 1980s, but there were very few, and, and they're not very relevant as far as contemporary cows is concerned. Um, but this review that was done here by Ian Lean and others from, from Australia uh, were looking effectively, essentially, at the effects of, of excess protein, either excess protein in the diet or high levels of rumen degradable protein in the diet. And this is a sort of what they call a meta-analysis, a, su a summary of all the studies that have been done. And the conclusion is that if you feed too much protein or too much degradable nitrogen in the diet, that you can actually impair fertility, a 9% reduction in the chances of becoming pregnant if you feed excess levels of nitrogen. But we were interested in feeding low levels of protein in the diet. And here we've, we're looking at some sort of fertility parameters. Um, this is the, uh, and this little figure here is the days to first progesterone rise. That's when the cows start cycling again, essentially. And there was, there was no difference between our treatments. There was a hint that it was slightly lower on the long, low protein, longer on the low protein diets, and I could argue that that's beneficial rather than detrimental. Um, there was a difference between Nottingham and Harper Adams in terms of the incidence of abnormal ovarian activity, but again, no dietary effect. However, there was an indication. Um, that there may be a dietary effect uh, at Harper Adams. And pro this is progesterone levels at, at day five following AI. And the higher the progesterone levels are on day five, the greater the chance that the embryo will survive following insemination. And there's a suggestion at Harper Adams that there, there might be a beneficial effect of feeding less protein, but that wasn't evident at all at, at Nottingham. Finally then, um, we looked at conception rate to first insemination. We had a voluntary waiting period of about 49 days. Uh, before we inseminated the cows. Uh, there was no dietary effect once again. If you delay in timing of insemination, you get higher conception rates. There's a tendency for people to inseminate cows too early. Um, there was a difference between the two centres, but this was due to a technical problem with the artificial insemination at Harp Adams. It had nothing to do with the cows themselves, which otherwise were, if anything, more fertile than the cows uh, at Nottingham. So just to draw out the main uh, take-home messages from this, we can say um, that we can reduce crude proteins. If you get the formulation right and you drop metabolizable protein by around about 5% below predicted requirements, you can reduce crude protein levels down to around about 15% with no hit in milk yield during early lactation. And uh, this is true for whether they're rotary parlor 
um, milked or, or robotic systems. Um, you definitely reduce the amount of nitrogen that's been ex excreted. You reduce feed costs, and there's no detrimental effect in terms of fertility or lameness. Um, there is potential to mitigate effects on milk yield, but we didn't really see that very much in, in, in our study. But you might do if you fed lower levels of protein or if you had them on alternative sources of forages, such as, for example, high levels of grass or perhaps legume-based silages, where there might be a greater scope to capture uh, excess rumen degradable protein uh, in the rumen. Um, but with the diets that we'd fed, that you, you remember that the levels of urea nitrogen in the milk were already quite low, so we were already quite efficient in terms of capturing nitrogen. So with that, I would just like to end, and, and uh, we've got a few minutes to take uh, questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kevin. Is there any questions from the floor? We have literally two minutes. I just want to wait for mics. Kevin will be around for the afternoon, so you can corner him in the halls or at lunchtime and um, ask him any questions you might have that we don't have time for. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much for that. Excellent, I thought. Um, you say a 5% reduction when you formulated the rations. On purpose, did you balance it for MPE and MPN? Yeah, so the, the uh, rumen degradable nitrogen, or if you want to call it, effective rumen degradable protein, was in excess of a uh, metabolizable crude protein requirement. So the ratio was about, I can't, I can't remember what the ratio was, but it was positive 1.14, 1.15, something like that overall. So the animals were not deficient in rumen degradable nitrogen. So what they were deficient on was ATP in the rumen or, or the net fermentable metabolizable energy. Um, so that's why we thought with the, the third treatment uh, that, that by boosting that that we might capture maybe more nitrogen in the rumen. One, one more quick question, sorry, but we'll have to wrap it up. Then. Um, David, Jacqueline, independent consultant. I just wondered why it was found necessary to put soy pass across treatments on those uh, Nottingham and Harper Adams milk production experiments because it's a commercial product, obviously. Um, I, I guess we're just trying to, you know, when you, when you formulate these diets, you're just trying to get a balance of um, what you predict uh, or estimate would be, you know, the supply of digestible undegradable protein and try and standardise that as much as you possibly can across the treatments. The, the soy pass level was, was health fixed. It wasn't one of the ingredients that we actually varied in the diet. So based on the original formulation, it was just a little bit of digestible undegradable protein coming in there um, in case, you know, just to supplement uh, anything that we may or may not capture, you know, in terms of microbial protein. I don't know. We can chat about that afterwards because we're running out of time. <laughs>